The Tom Woods Show, episode 741. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, don't be envious of me just because I'm getting the best shave of my life. Join me. Get your free trial set from Harry's. That's a razor, five-blade cartridge, and shaving gel. Plus, they're tossing in a post-shave balm. And all you got to do is pay three smackers for shipping. So head over to harrys.com. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com. And enter code WOODS. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here, and I am so glad that David Stockman is back with us. We haven't talked to David in a long time. Some of my favorite episodes of this show are with David as a guest. I've got all the previous appearances by David Stockman on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 741. In fact, one interview I did with David was so great that I even included it in my last book, Real Descent, A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. I put an interview with David Stockman in there because it was just so darn good. At any rate, I'm particularly glad to speak to David this week because he's just released a brand new book called Trumped, A Nation on the Brink of Ruin and How to Bring It Back. I'll be linking to that at tomwoods.com slash 741. And it's my pleasure to welcome David back to the show right now. David, thanks for being here. I'm very happy to be here, uh, Tom. All right. So you have this new book, Trumped. I've been reading it. And just when I think you're about to say something I don't agree with, then you stop and you say, now, on the other hand, <laughs> Trump says all these terrible things. So I, I'm pretty much in agreement with you. I, I've had several people on with whom I have come to the conclusion that the destruction of the Bush family was a great service to America, and I credit Trump with that. And discombobulating the elites, I credit him with that. I just wish he could be – a different person than than who he is. I wish he saw the true causes of of our problems. And unfortunately, you know, we, once in a while you get a glimpse from him. He'll say that the 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 Fed is is uh, causing bubbles and this and that. But on the other hand, as you point out in your book, he says he's a low interest rate man. So sort out for us who Donald Trump really is. Okay, first of all, let me be very clear. This book is not a brief for Trump. It's an indictment of 30 years of what I call uh, Wall Street Washington uh, policy of the ruling elites centered on debt at home, war abroad, and a rogue central bank that is out of control, is basically destroyed price discovery, as we well know in the financial markets, turned everything into a casino, and Ultimately, that ha does more immediate damage uh, in the short run. The long run, it wrecks everything. But in the short run, it hits flyover America the hardest because the wor last thing flyover America needs, and that's the whole expanse between uh, the coasts, the last thing it needs is to have inflation pushing its nominal wages higher. That's how we lose uh, uh, jobs, good jobs, to the China price on goods and the India price on services. Uh, inflation doesn't rise in lockstep like uh, Yellen and Bernanke and the rest of them think. In fact, uh, the working classes lose uh, to inflation because their wages are going up, but not as fast as their cost of living. So it's a double whammy. Some jobs are lost and the wages they earn buy less. Uh, flyover America can't afford to gamble in the stock market or high yield bond funds. They what meager amounts they can save out of their current income has to go in the bank, and they earn nothing. It is being you know recycled uh, to the banks and to Wall Street in the form of this perverse uh, and uh, inverse uh, Robin Hood policy. So. Uh, the point of my book is to say the Trump phenomena has happened because flyover America is uh, awakening politically and his rhetoric about the system being rigged uh, is uh, resonating with them, even if the substance of his program, which for the most part <laughs> is hard to uh, uh, pinpoint and to assess uh, isn't necessarily the answer to the problem. On the other hand, I call uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, a uh, bag of 30-year 
30-year uh, bag of deplorables. That's what her policy is. And I'm not talking about uh, her supporters. I'm talking about uh, her policies, her ideas, and her record. She is the embodiment of the status quo, the embodiment of a system uh, that wants more debt, more wars, and, and more, uh, you know, uh, financial bubbles. So uh, we have to pay our money and take our choices. And in this election, uh, the choice, uh, you know, as uh, unappetizing as it may be in some ways, because Trump is out of control on law and order and, you know, walls on the Mexican border and terrorists uh, lurking everywhere. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, I think uh, you don't have any choice but to at least say that a Trump uh, presidency would stop the machine cold and at least, uh, uh, you know, offer the possibility that uh, when everything collapses, and I think it would, you know, it would be, a, it would destroy confidence in the Fed, in the financial markets, there'd be a huge meltdown, there'd be a recession, there would be uh, trouble everywhere that would undermine entirely this phony uh, fantasy world of economics that we've had for the last 20 or 25 years. So that isn't a very hopeful uh, prescription, but it's kind of uh, the core thesis of the book. Let me throw one curveball at you with regard to that. I've had more or less the same opinion of the situation, but then the extent to which Trump is really anti-establishment I think is called into question when you look at the people he surrounds himself with. In foreign policy, he keeps adding neoconservatives to his team, and he's surrounded by, what, Chris Christie, Rudy Giuliani, Ben Carson, and Newt Gingrich. I mean, is this, this is the team that's going to upend things? Uh, well, uh, you know, the only thing you can say uh, about that is the team around Hillary is worse, okay? <laughs> okay. Why in the world are we in a uh, fight for the moment, uh, you know, at this moment with Putin and Russia? Why is NATO encroaching on the very borders uh, of Russia? It's because of the neocon policy coming out of the Clinton State Department, and frankly, Victoria Nuland, as you know, is uh, about as neocon as they come, married into the family, likely to be uh, the, you know, the leading candidate for Secretary of State, and at least on things like that, Trump has said, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm a deal guy, maybe I can make a deal with Putin. That seems like a thin uh, veneer of hope. But at least it's not Hillary, uh, uh, you know, harumphing that um, uh, Putin is uh, a modern day Hitler, which is utterly ridiculous, or uh, something I posted on my blog that your listeners might be, just go listen to it, it's 10 seconds, about her chortling and giggling uh, about her accomplishment in Libya. We came, we saw, he died, and then uh, she goes into hysterical laughing. So uh, between uh, Trump maybe getting some bad advice from uh, recycled uh, neocons um, and Hillary uh, being the uh, you know a pedigree uh, warfare state uh, bag carrier, you know you, again as I say before, uh, you take your choice, you pay your money and take your choices and. Uh, at least, as I said in the book, and I, and I think this is kind of uh, all we have to hope for, Trump is not schooled in 30 years of beltway, mythology, uh, pretense, arrogance, and uh, kind of uh, the Kool-Aid that is dispensed in the imperial city. So uh, that gives you at least some hope that a few people with different views might sneak into his uh, administration or he might be confronted with problems that are so uh, severe and pressing and, and uh, urgent that he may have to look for a new way to go. And I think that's going to happen on defense. I don't know who in the heck has advised him that we are behind on defense and we need to increase the defense budget. But when he gets there and the economy is buckled into recession and the forecast for the next year for the deficit go to plus one trillion, 
all of a sudden he may have to rethink whether there's any uh, money that can possibly be put uh, into the defense to budget, uh, budget. So, you know, it's kind of, uh, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the story on many of these issues, the Fed, defense spending, uh, big government, the deficit, uh, and all the rest of it. I bet when you go on TV, people say things to you like, look, David, the employment figures are great. The stock market is booming. You're just a perma bear. What's the matter with you? Now, in your book, you have what I consider one of the most revealing statistics ever used by anyone, which is your statistic about breadwinner jobs since the turn of the century. Right. So flesh that out. Tell it what is really going on with the economy. Well, uh, you know, you have the Fed and, uh, I mean, you have the BLS, uh, which uh, – has created really mathematical models of the job market, which more or less, uh, once they get a recovery momentum going, and there's been a real recovery, but I say that uh, a partial recovery, a weak recovery, but I say that's the uh, inherent regenerative powers of capitalism after uh, the collapse in 2008, 2009 caused by the Fed. But anyway, you get a little uh, economic expansion going. They lay down their model, which uh, uh, projects and, and uh, uh, forecasts uh, job growth at certain rates. And then they do surveys to more or less prove it. This is another whole long story we can get into another time. But I don't put much stock in those numbers. They get constantly revived. They never see a recession coming. I demonstrated this again in this book that between May 2008 and uh, about uh, May 2009, there was uh, 7 million jobs lost um, and no one saw that coming and it's in the numbers today and wasn't in the numbers at the time initially because the Fed was way, I mean the uh, BLS was way over forecasting jobs. So I go back to the beginning, I sort out their numbers and I say let's divide the job of the so-called establishment survey into three buckets, breadwinner jobs, which are full-time, full pay, average $50,000 plus or minus a year. They're in manufacturing, construction, mining and energy, the white collar professions, uh, finance, insurance, real estate, uh, information technology, those kinds of sectors. Then the second one is part-time jobs, which are basically bars and restaurants and retail gigs and uh, um, temp agency uh, uh, employment and so forth and then the third is the HES complex health education and social services the key point of that is almost all of the revenue from sales which support jobs in that sector uh, come from government budgets which are more or less busted my point on all of this is since Bill Clinton was packing his bags to leave the Oval Office in January 19, or 2001, there, there has been a 1.4 million loss of this first basket, the breadwinner basket. There were 72.5 million breadwinner jobs then in the categories I described. There's only 71 some uh, million in that category today. You've gone a whole century so far and you haven't created one breadwinner job. What they count and you get in Jobs Friday, you know, once a month, is part-time jobs that come and go as the cycle booms and busts because of what we know the Fed is doing, or an expansion of so-called, uh, what I call the HES complex, that at some point has to grind to a halt or everybody's going to be working in hospitals and kindergartens, okay? But there's no productivity coming out of there and there's no way to support real long-term growth, uh, productivity, and prosperity uh, when it's simply government-created economic activity or government-funded economic activity uh, that um, uh, is reaching its uh, uh, limits. So that's the first big thing I have in the book, and I show that there, you know, I show that dearth of breadwinner jobs for a whole decade uh, or 15, 16 years. The second thing I did in the book, and I think it's really important uh, to emphasize, is we went back and took apart the CPI, which I, I know a lot of people understand really undermeasures true inflation. What people in flyover America, as I call it, face in terms 
of the big four. Uh, and by that, I mean medical costs, uh, housing costs, food costs, and energy. And measure, and we measure those correctly. I mean, the BLS totally undermeasures uh, the cost of uh, health, which has been soaring. They totally undermeasure the cost of uh, housing uh, because of the methods they use. My point uh, is in the book that the average inflation rate with a proper CPI, uh, consumer price index, which we call the flyover CPI, uh, two-thirds of it consists of those big four items that I mentioned, has been 3% a year since Greenspan took over the Fed in 87, and it hasn't slowed down even in this so-called world of deflation and uh, lower oil prices and so forth. Even last year it was up 2% when uh, the CPI was flat and Fed insisted uh, there was a dearth of inflation. Now, when you take that as the deflator for all these different numbers we're always looking at, like median household income, um, or retail sales, or uh, you know, lots of other measures, when you deflate those numbers with the flyover CPI, you get a totally different and less, uh, po far less positive picture than what the establishment uh, puts out and what the Obama White House crows about. In fact, uh, the median uh, household income in 2015 was 20% lower in uh, real dollars with the flyover CPI than it was in the year 2000. So let's just think about that then. For the last 16 years, no breadwinner job gains at all and the purchasing power of what wages remain in flyover America down 20%. Now, is there any wonder why, uh, you know, the, as we say, the rubes are coming uh, out of the, uh, their houses and marching to, to, to the political rallies and hopefully to the ballot box with this kind of economic deterioration and setback underway, uh, it's no wonder, uh, you know, the phrase, we're not going to take it anymore, uh, has, uh, you know, developed the resonance that it has. David, I want to shift gears and ask about trade in a minute, but first, let's thank our sponsor. Folks, reviewing the demographic statistics for The Tom Woods Show reminds me that I have an awful lot of men listening to this show. I'll just leave it at that. And I'm willing to bet a lot of you men are shavers. And if you're like me, you want to have a nice close shave, but for some reason, you just can't get the blade to work the way it works for other people. They have this smooth shave and... They look like they've got a baby's bottom for a face, and you've got a face that's all hacked up and bloody, and you look like you're in an axe murderer movie. Well, that does not happen for me anymore since I started using Harry's. Closest and most comfortable shave I've ever gotten. I don't have to use electric anymore. Now, here's a great chance for you to have the same experience I did. Harry's will send you their popular free trial set, which comes with a razor, a five-blade cartridge, and shaving gel. And all you got to do is pay three smackers for shipping. Plus, enter code WOODS at checkout, and they'll throw in a post-shave balm for free. So how about that? You get the razor, the five-blade cartridge, the shaving gel, and you enter code WOODS, and you get the post-shave balm for free. Head on over to harrys.com to grab this deal. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S, harrys.com, and use code WOODS. Let's shift gears and talk about one of the major themes Trump has raised, which is trade. And early on in your book, you reject the idea that people should be blaming trade for the current situation of the U.S. economy and the parlous situation of U.S. workers. But yet – you can surely see there's a kind of plausibility to what he's saying, that we have these trade deals, and then in the wake of them, well, we see people's wages falling and employment prospects falling. We see whole towns wiped out. We see their manufacturing hollowed out. And I think these people say, who am I, who am I supposed to believe, my own eyes or your economic theories about the benefits of free trade? So how do you answer that? Well, uh, that is a great question. I think it's the heart of what needs to be uh, thought about creatively. I have a whole chapter in the book, Chapter 5, 
and is entitled Trump isn't all wrong about trade uh, the betrayal of American workers by the Fed and I think this is really important to understand and the slogan I use is the worst combination the most toxic combination imaginable economically is free trade and free money free trade is great free money is terrible you put them together and you tremendously distort the entire uh, economic process and in particular and this is why uh, I uh, you know go right to it Fed policy with the inflation targeting that Bernanke uh, formalized but was there all the way back to Greenspan is the worst thing that can happen in a world where uh, borders are open, where trade is relatively free, both in services and goods, and where workers in the middle and lower end of the spectrum face the China price on goods and the India price on services. Because the Fed says we inflate uh, happily together in lockstep, does, you know, inflation doesn't mean anything, 2% a year, wages are up, prices are up, rents are up, uh, everybody lives happily ever after, totally wrong, a destructive myth. What happens is the average hourly wage in the United States went from $9 an hour in 1987 to around $22 an hour today. That sounds like uh, improvement, but actually adjusted for the flyover CPI, real wages are way down, and even by the BLS of uh, the CPI, uh, they have been flat to down. So what happens is, the uh, on the margin, the nominal wages uh, increasing by a factor of two or three means that jobs are going to China or its supply base, or they're going uh, back office jobs and sales and data crunching and so forth are going to India. So the worst thing we should do, the last thing we should do is target any inflation at all. The only way to compete, uh, the, the right way uh, to have free trade is to have um, a central bank that does not uh, attempt to uh, force inflation in the domestic economy and in fact a monetary system that would actually lead to deflation. In other words, uh, if uh, nature had been allowed to take its course and not Greenspan's crowing about uh, the wonderful achievement he made by getting inflation down to 2%, the price level since the late 80s would have gone down. Re, uh, nominal wages wouldn't have gone from $9 uh, to 22 They might have been flat. And in that environment, not nearly as many jobs would have been offshored, migrated abroad, because there is still uh, what I call the offshoring premium. There is a 12,000-mile pipeline uh, supply chain that costs money, uh, not just the freight, but uh, everything that goes with it in terms of the risk of delivery, uh, damage to merchandise, uh, sourcing uh, risks, and on and on. So the point is that there is a offshoring premium uh, but when, on wages, but when you try to deliberately inflate at 2% year after year after year, uh, you uh, obliterate that premium and uh, jobs go uh, marching uh, abroad. So uh, that's not a small point, it's a huge point. The heart of what the Fed's doing, and most central banks in the developed world, uh, is inflation targeting and insisting without a shred of evidence that 2% inflation is the magic elixir that causes uh, economic growth and job creation. That is upside down. It actually undermines economic growth, causes massive trade deficits that aren't natural deficits, causes good jobs to be offshored. And as a result of that, I believe the problem that Trump has identified, you know, 500 billion of imports from China or 60 billion from um, uh, uh, Mexico, the problem he's identified is not caused 
it's not caused by bad trade deals, really. It's caused by horrendously bad monetary policy. So the uh, target uh, of the attack ought to be the Fed and not, as I say, the USTR, you know, the U.S. Uh, trade uh, representative. I'm not saying that the, the deals that they have on the table now uh, amount to anything, you know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and so forth. That's just a big corporate uh, deal to, um, you know, uh, suit their convenience. But I, I, I don't believe uh, it's going to make that big a difference on uh, trade volume one way or another. What we have to focus on now is getting monetary policy back into a, a less of an anti-jobs posture and also uh, get a tax policy, and I wrote about this in my blog the other day, that recognizes uh, that we've stranded American workers at high nominal wages because of this inflation policy, and we need to find some way to offset it. You can't wind back the CPI. It's already you know, up in the stratosphere after 20 years where it is today. But I think we can change the focus of tax policy to reducing the payroll tax and therefore the wedge between what a worker takes home and what a business pays on the margin uh, to, uh, for an hour of employment, remove that 15% wedge. And I think it would go a long way to rejuvenating uh, job growth because the cost uh, wedge would be lower and giving the worker in flyover America a break. You know, there's 160 million people paying payroll taxes. There may be 10 million people on the margin paying most of the income taxes. In theory, cut both of them. But if you can't uh, afford to do both in this in deflationary environment, in this, uh, you know, uh, drought of jobs uh, environment, uh, the thing to do, I think, uh, is not what we did in the 80s, because that was an inflationary bracket creep environment. But what we ought to do uh, today is uh, eliminate the payroll tax entirely and play, replace it with a tax on consumption and imports. Now, it's the same thing. But uh, since we import such a large fraction of the goods that we use, if you were to actually um, exempt, say, healthcare and a few other things from the 10 trillion of consumption uh, in the U.S. each year and tax the balance at 15 percent, you would have enough revenue to replace the social uh, insurance taxes, uh, the payroll taxes, and the corporate tax in entirely. Now, I think that uh, taking, a, it amounts to about a, a trillion five of year, a year. The corporate tax is 400 billion and payroll is 1.1 trillion. So if you took 1.5 trillion worth of taxes off workers and employers and you put uh, and you replaced it with a tax on imports from China and elsewhere and consumption, then we would be doing the right supply side thing. I, I think you got some very geriatric supply siders who are in a time warp from the 1980s and don't recognize that in the world that we have today, what we need to be uh, addressing is taxing uh, labor and business less and uh, taxing uh, consumption and imports more. The supply side theory says you'll get more of the former and less of the latter, and frankly, that's what we need at this late stage because of, uh, of uh, all the ruin that's already been done by monetary policy since 1987. Well, I'd like to pick up on that, but I know I'm just about out of time with you. I still feel like I, I want people to know that your book includes 10 deals that you'd like to see a President Trump or any president make with the people that might actually begin to get us out of the mess we're in. And one of them is a sound money deal. I just want to point out one aspect of your sound money deal involves abolishing the Federal Open Market Committee. So I want to emphasize you were the director of the Office of Management and Budget under Ronald Reagan. So you're not just some guy with a newsletter. Yeah. And you are advocating abolishing – you're basically ad advocating the end – 
to monetary policy itself. You would be taking away the ability of the Fed to make monetary policy and to try to target and control certain aggregates. Yes, I call it central, uh, you know, monetary central planning. And although it sounds radical, the thing that's important about this chapter, and I have a whole uh, chapter on that, is if you go back to Carter Glass, who was the author of the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, that was exactly his vision. His vision was there would be no activist uh, monetary policy. They didn't have any idea of targeting GDP or wages or unemployment rate or uh, C, you know, the PCE less uh, food and energy, none of that. The whole idea was that uh, the Fed would be 12 decentralized banks that were bankers' banks, and that would, uh, in a, um, be available to supply credit at the market rate of interest with a penalty spread above it against good commercial cl collateral, which is to say receivables or finished inventory. They couldn't even bring to the Fed window, as it was conceived by Carter Glass, government bonds. They weren't eligible collateral. And what that meant was that the uh, expansion and contraction of the Fed's balance sheet would not happen in Washington, but uh, on a decentralized basis at 12 banks and that it would be driven by the ebb and flow of uh, industry and commerce by the business system and not by economists or politicians or government apparatchiks uh, in Washington. So that's actually what abolishing the FOMC means. The FO FOMC didn't even exist till 1917 when uh, in order to finance the World War I, they is that they discovered they had a printing press and they could buy government bonds uh, and make ends meet. So I think uh, there's an, it's, it's kind of the heart of the matter. And if you just talk about telling the Fed to be more restrained or doing something, you know, like uh, uh, who's the professor um, Taylor with his rules. If you look at Professor Taylor's rules, it's as bad as Bernanke. You know, uh, take inflation minus this plus that and the uh, uh, potential GDP versus the actual GDP plus and minus. This is a lot of gobbledygook. Capitalism can operate with a price system in the financial markets, including free interest rates. And if you're going to have a central bank at all, it should be a banker's bank that uh, operates under the very restrictive rules uh, that Carter Glass put in place in 1913 and that we've unfortunately completely abandoned with what uh, we have today, which is essentially Keynesian monetary central planning. Well, the book is Trumped, A Nation on the Brink of Ruin and How to Bring It Back. Linking to it at tomwoods.com slash 741, which is the number of today's episode. Also linking there to David Stockman's contracorner.com, which you are completely crazy if you're not visiting every day. Uh, David, best of luck. And if we don't manage to get you on Contra Krugman soon, we're going to have to seek you out and bodily get you onto the show because we've had a lot of demand for that. Thanks again. Definitely like to do that. So, uh We'll uh, look forward to it. All right. At the end there, I mentioned what I might call my sister podcast that I do with Bob Murphy once a week. I do the Tom Woods show every single weekday, and you become a smarter libertarian every single weekday. So you got to subscribe to the show. You're not going to be sorry about that. You're going to be glad that you did that. But you're also going to be glad that you subscribed to Contra Krugman because th that, that's just a winner. That idea is a winner. So check that out also at uh, ContraKrugman.com. So you got TomWoods.com for this show and ContraKrugman.com for that podcast. We are going to get David Stockman on there one of these days and have some fun uh, going after Krugman. All right, lots of fun stuff coming up this week. Tomorrow I'm actually talking to a listener of this here show who wrote to tell me that he listened to the show, he read some libertarian material, and he came to the conclusion that he simply could no longer serve in the military any longer. So I thought, what the heck, let's have him on and talk about it. So that's coming up tomorrow, episode 742. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.